Comrades, and welcome to today's O'Malley Tommy Sunday study featuring Chairman Amalia Shatella. My name is Akili Anai, the Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party, as well as your MC for this morning. Make sure to hit that like button and share this video from the platform you're viewing from. This week, Chairman Amalia Shatella continues a study on dialectical materialism. He will read from Materialism and the Dialectical Method by Maurice Cornforth starting at the top of page 46 with the subhead, The Dialectical Conception of Development. The study materials have been linked in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions for your benefit. For the first hour, the chairman will review the study materials and in the second hour, we'll open it up to you, our live viewers, to ask your questions. It's my honor now to introduce our leadership, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amalia Shatella. Uhuru Chairman. Uhura, comrade. Uh, good to be with you again, comrade director uh, Akile. I understand that is smoking hot there where you are. And um, I just wanted to uh, greet everyone and uh, welcome you to this discussion on today. And the other thing I would like to do is to say that uh, some of this that we're looking at now may may appear a bit complicated. It's just the way, you know, uh, words and ideas are thrown together and thrown at us and they were not uh, written and put together, uh, particularly for our ability to participate uh, in this discussion. Uh, much of this some, uh, is um, directed at uh, people who, uh, whose basic activity uh, is, uh, uh, intellectual stuff. And while we are engaged in the African People's Socialist Party in developing our own uh, working class intellectuals, this is exactly why we're going through this particular study. Uh, the language that we uh, would use, I think, would be a bit different from what we're experiencing now. So you shouldn't be put off by the language, one. Two, I really would hope that uh, that uh, this is uh, taken seriously enough that you would uh, look at it, that you would study it, that you won't be satisfied with just the discussion that we're having uh, in these, on these Sunday meetings and that you will take the materials that we are, 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 are using and then uh, look at them, uh, study them, go through them again so that, so that you become more comfortable uh, with the ideas. Uh, uh, and also, uh, again, I would suggest that if you would look and most of the works uh, that I have uh, that I have authored, to, and, and more specifically, more recently, the political reports to the sixth and seventh uh, Congress of the African People's Socialist Party, you will actually see uh, these uh, ideas that we're talking about actually uh, being uh, put forth in a very practical way, solving practical problems. That's one of the reasons we engage in this discussion. The other thing is related to the whole notion of of African working class intellectuals, uh, because they are uh, people who uh, pride themselves in just being so much smarter than everybody else. And in fact, uh, they use uh, information and, and words and terms like those that we use today as means of uh, lording it over the people. And, and uh, they, uh, many of them, or certainly some of them that we are familiar with and have contact with on a regular basis are careerists. They 
uh, not revolutionaries in any sense of the word. And uh, for them, uh, what we see is not a really uh, theory or even uh, adherence to uh, obvious kinds of philosophy. Uh, rather, uh, they are all over the place and they're not even what is often referred to as eclectic. They're more like, uh, like ideological chameleons that, that they go this way and that way depending on the circumstances. And uh, we characterize them as pop philosophers or popular philosopher, whatever's trending, uh, they go with that uh, for the while, the, the moment that it seems to be trending and people seems to be, seem to be uh, adhering uh, to these terms and ideas, that's where they'll go. But what we <clears throat> have to do is really build a foundation of, of uh, revolutionaries who at least have some familiarity uh, uh, with the revolutionary theory, uh, with uh, how we come to theoretical conclusions, with uh, the uh, a scientific means by uh, method of investigation and analyzing society so that uh, we understand uh, where it is that we are now, how we got there, and what it takes to move us forward. Uh, obviously, uh, you don't necessarily have to know this in order to pass out a flyer that's really important for us to get done, but knowing it will be able to tell you why you should pass that flyer out. Uh, it helps us to understand uh, uh, things uh, like, uh, like the, making a distinction between just change and development, how uh, uh, changes occur all the time. And that uh, all the activity that we're involved in most of the time with the flyers and the sun and the burning spear and the conferences and the meetings that we have, uh, they are contributing to change. But when we understand this from a dialectical approach, we understand that when you're looking at, uh, at change to quantitative movement is what we are considering now. And quantitative uh, movement simply is movement uh, 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 like, uh, uh, um, like uh, in, in degrees, like whether or not it's faster, slower, hotter, colder, et cetera. Those are quantitative changes. And these changes are, are, are changes that's been put in motion by the activities that we engage in on a regular basis in the same way uh, as we go back to this tired analogy of uh, putting uh, water <clears throat> on, a, on a teapot on a stove and you turn it on and, and you can't necessarily see the changes that's happening right away. These are quantitative changes that we have a change in the temperature it's a gradual change in the temperature that's occurring, uh, but it reaches a certain place where it moves from just that quantitative change to it makes a qualitative leap. And this, this leap is what we characterize as development so that it's no longer just a liquid water that's being heated, but the, heated. But the leap now is where the water turns into steam. Uh, uh, and the steam is a gas, right? So from, uh, you you're dealing uh, initially uh, uh, with water, the liquid, uh, and you have a situation where you apply the heat to it on a, a consistent uh, basis. And over a period of time, this, this change, uh, this quantitative change of water being heated uh, makes a leap. Uh, and so that it's no longer like what we would characterize as simply quantitative change as a qualitative change, and it turns into gas. This is the steam that uh, comes from the water, and this is what we characterize as development. <clears throat> We're gonna see that kind of being discussed here, but the point that I'm making is we've been involved in political work, and I use the example right now of what uh, we were doing in, uh, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida for years and years and years. Uh, we are consistently doing the work. We are consistently out among the masses. We are consistently passing out information, participating in demonstrations, leading mobilization against this and that, et cetera, consistently doing this. Uh, uh, and we are heading uh, in a particular direction. There is a to what end. For us, the action is not the end unto itself. It's to help us to get to a different place. Uh, is to help to get to a place of, 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 uh, that we might characterize as development where the leap is made. <clears throat> so we've done this work. And then on one occasion, the police comes into the community, kills this young African brother. Uh, and when that happened, the mass of the people then come 
to us and all of the work we've been doing, all of this work that's uh, passing out flyers that didn't necessarily seem to be taking us anywhere. Uh, we see that the significance of that work comes together. People now come uh, to us uh, for a certain kind of leadership, an explosion happens, a great leap happens. Uh, there's a, a, a rebellion that happens in the streets. And so even though we couldn't see uh, the consciousness of the people moving uh, uh, as it was moving, and it wasn't necessarily obvious to us, this quantitative change uh, did lead, does lead uh, to qualitative uh, change that we characterize as development, this leap from that one state to another state. This is part of what understanding dialectical dialectics is all about. So I wanna go now to uh, Cornforth uh, and I want to uh, you know, do the traditional disclaimer. I, you know, Cornforth uh, makes everything uh, that he's talking about due to Marxism. He characterizes the method of investigation, the scientific method of investigation and analysis that Marx played a, a really important role in, in developing uh, for the era that he lived in and for the even for this era. Uh, uh, he characterizes that as Marx's philosophy. And uh, we disagree with that considerably because obviously uh, you, the, the method is what helps us to uh, uh, gives us the ability to analyze uh, uh, society, to investigate society. And then uh, from this, we develop a philosophy that will be more or less scientific based on the success we have and the effect effectiveness of using, using this dialectical and historical materialism method of investigation and analysis. So uh, let's go then uh, to point uh, forth. And we're on page 46, uh, uh, the dialectical conception of development. Uh, we just talked about that a moment ago, just now. So here's, here's Cornforth. Whereas the older philosophy is considered that the universe always remained much the same, a perpetual cycle of the same processes, science has demonstrated the fact of evolution. But while recognizing the fact of evolutionary development, bourgeois thinkers have tried to understand and explain it in fantastic idealist terms. And they have conceived the development as being always a smooth, continuous process, not recognizing the occurrence of abrupt breaks in continuity, the leap from one stage to another. Following up the ideas of Hegel, which was an important kind of German philosopher that influenced uh, Marx and, and Engels and had some very nasty attitudes about African Africa, uh, but following up the ideas of Hegel by taking up the revolutionary side of his philosophy, while freeing it of his idealist trammels, Marx and Engels established a dialectical materialist conception of development. The key to understanding development in nature and society and the leaps and breaks in continuity which characterizes all the real development lies in the recognition of the inner contradictions and opposite conflicting tendencies which are in motion in all processes. This discovery by Marx and Engels was a revolution in philosophy and made of it a revolutionary weapon of the working people, a method of, invest, of understanding the world so as to change it. And we are talking about uh, the, uh, he mentions here, uh, the inner contradictions and opposite conflicting tendencies which are, op operation, are in operation in all processes. Don't be intimidated about that because you, you see this all the time and uh, in various things. And when you put the water that we talked about on the stove, what begins to happen, you heat the water and the molecules uh, in the water begin to move quite rapidly. This is a contradiction inside the liquid itself. And they begin to uh, move quite rapidly to, uh, to the point that they um, make this leap of transformation from this being the liquid to the gas that we're talking about. We're saying these are the inner contradictions and opposite conflicting tendencies which exist in all process existing in this liquid, that's water. The rapid motion of the, of the uh, molecules that, uh, that lead to uh, this change in the state uh, from liquid to gas. The idea of evolution. We have seen that the corrections of a mechanistic standpoint made by dialectical materialism are fully justified by and have a basis in the advance of science. Indeed, the advance of science itself has shattered the whole conception of the universe held by the older me mechanistic materialists. 
According to that conception, the universe always remained much the same. It was a huge machine which always did the same things, kept grinding out the same products, went on and on in a perpetual, perpetual cycle of the same processes. I'm going to be trying to move quickly, and a lot of this is going to require gain on your investigation, your study of uh, this material that we're using. Thus, it used to be thought uh, that the stars and the solar system always remained the same, and that the Earth, with its continents and oceans and the plants and animals inhabiting them, uh, likewise, always remained the same. But this conception has given, given way to the conception of evolution, which, was, uh, uh, which has invaded all spheres of investigation without exception. Nor was it scientific investigation alone which produced the idea of evolution. Science does not advance in isolation from society as a whole. The idea of evolution was generated out of the, out of the rise of industrial capitalism itself. And, uh, and uh, you know, you make, yeah, so the bourgeois can, bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of society. Conservation of the old modes of production in un unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence of all earlier industrial classes. Let's go back again. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production and thereby the relations of production and with them the whole relations of production. We're talking about the bourgeoisie now. We're talking about the emergence of a, of a of a particular class that, uh, and we're speaking specifically now of that class as it uh, as emerged in Europe from the feudal mode of production. We've talked about these different modes of production, uh, and so, uh, but the bourgeoisie, the it, like all uh, classes, uh, will do uh, everything to try to maintain uh, society as it is. Uh, um, all ruling classes, they don't want change uh, because change uh, suggests that their uh, being swept away uh, uh, and, and not being able uh, to hold on to what it is they have, all the conference and all of the prestige and everything that goes with being the rulers, all the wealth and resources. Uh, uh, the idea of change uh, is something that threatens uh, their, uh, their uh, perception of their longevity, uh, et cetera. So they, that makes them conservative in terms of their worldview because they are afraid of change. Uh, so we say that uh, conservation of the old modes of production in un unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence of all earlier industrial classes. Not just industrial classes. We will say we have said, and we're going to say this. We're going to see this moving forward. That conservation of the old modes of production in unaltered form was on the contrary, the first condition of existence of our earlier industrial classes. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguished the bourgeois epoch, epoch from all earlier, earlier ones. The industrial capitalists saw themselves as the bearers of progress. And as they thought progress was the law of capitalism, so they saw it as the law of the whole universe. So there was made possible a great adva advance in the scientific picture of the universe. We find developing a picture of the universe not as static, as always the same, but as in continual progressive development. The stars did not always exist. They were formed out of masses of dispersed gas. Once formed, the stellar system with all the stars in it goes through an evolutionary process stage by stage. Some stars, like our sun, acquire planets, a solar system. Thus, the Earth was born. As its surface cooled, so chemical compounds were formed, impossible in the high temperatures of the stars. Thus, matter began to manifest new properties, non-existent before the properties of chemical combination. Then organic compounds were formed out of the complex linking of carbon atoms, and from organic matter, the first bodies arose, which began to manifest the properties of life, of living matter. Still new properties of matter emerged, the properties of living matter. Living organisms went through a long evolution leading eventually to man. With man, human society was born. And still new processes with new laws arose, the laws of society and the laws of thought. What comes next? 
capitalist science can go no further. Here it ends. Since capitalist science cannot contemplate the ending of capitalism, but socialist science shows that man himself is about to embark on a new phase of evolution, communist society, in which the whole social process will be brought under his own conscious planned direction. All of this is the evolutionary history of the material universe. Apart from the last point, it may be said that all common knowledge, that this is all common knowledge. Bourgeois thinkers know this as well as Marxists, though they often forget it. But Marxism not, does not only stress the fact that everything in the world goes through a process of development, what Marxism found out was how to understand and explain this development in a materialist way. Uh, and I just want to say, uh, moving forward, because I'm not going to, um, I hope not to talk that much. I really want to read a lot. Uh, but in some things that make uh, mix of what the Marxists are doing and have done, uh, similar to what prior, uh, uh, what, what previous uh, 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 forces who uh, are being discussed now, previous philosophers in terms of trying to hold on to the same old thing is that uh, the feudal, um, feudal mode of production that is about to be replaced uh, uh, is, and that, that uh, Marx is uh, involved in explaining and trying to move away from, uh, is this, this, this mode of production that came, uh, is something that Marx is born into. And the changing world uh, is one that Europe runs into, <clears throat> begins the process of uh, colonial slavery and colonialism. And what we are suggesting, what we are saying, what I am saying uh, 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 absolutely is that <clears throat> from feudalism, another mode of production <clears throat> developed and that this mode of production that developed was one that captured Marx and all of the other uh, uh, forces who lived uh, particularly in Europe and every place else uh, into it. And this mode of production was a feudal mode of production. And so when Marx now looks for explanations about the world, uh, he too is trapped uh, with uh, uh, feudalist uh, notions and, and means of uh, investigating and understanding the world, even uh, though he's unaware of, and even though he's capable, obviously, of uh, coming up with brilliant insights about how uh, this system worked. Uh, there are some things that he clearly could not uh, uh, he clearly did not understand, and this is where we are today, because we have to move beyond that old world, that old way of seeing things, that old way of understanding things, the old way uh, that the philosophers of the past uh, tried to perceive the world uh, and the reality that they were entrapped by. We're moving beyond that, uh, because the, the question is whether or not uh, those who, uh, participate, who benefit from uh, who preside over, uh, who uh, leaders of this, within this colonial mode of production can see moving beyond the colonial mode of production. They are trapped in the same way that Marx talks about the capitalist, quote unquote, being trapped and not being able to see, uh, to foresee socialism. The fact is that even the Marxists could not foresee socialism because they were trapped by a feudal mode of production. And feudalism is something uh, that had all these contradictions inside of it. I meant the, the uh, colonial mode of production. Colonial mode of production is also a, a, a mode of production uh, having within it various uh, kinds of contradictions that were much bigger than the contradictions that the uh, that uh, Europe uh, and what came to be known as European were uh, aware of as being a part of this thing that they were struggling through uh, uh, and, and trying to deal with. The whole new process had begun, had come into existence with colonial slavery. Uh, and we'll say more about that passing, moving forward. So the discovery of Marxism was the discovery of the laws of materialist dialectics. And that is why Marxism alone is able to give a fully scientific account of development and to point out the future path. And so we, we really appreciate to what Marx and Engels did in terms of uh, helping to consolidate an understanding uh, uh, and application of, uh, of, the, uh, of a, a dialectical and materialist uh, uh, kind of investigation and analysis of, of society, discover these laws of materialist dialectics as, as, as being discussed here by Cornforth. 
And so this is the meaning of Marx's great discovery, how to understand change and development in a materialist way, and therefore how to become masters of the future. Idealist conception of change and development. How did bourgeois thinkers try to account for the universal change and development which they discovered? Let us consider what some of them have had to say over a period of more than a century. Hegel, uh, who was uh, uh, as, uh, this uh, uh, German philosopher, again, who had a big influence on Marx and Engels and uh, a lot of other folk uh, during his period and who was critical uh, to uh, struggling to try uh, uh, and understand uh, the world as it was moving from uh, uh, feudalism uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, what would become uh, the colonial mode of production, in which uh, in part, I'm sure had a lot to do with Hegel's uh, view, negative uh, view of Africa and Africans. Hegel said that the whole process of development taking place in history was due to the absolute idea realizing itself in history. Uh, Herbert Spencer, another philosopher said that all development was a process of increasing integration of matter. And he put this down to what he called an incomprehensible and omnipresent power. Uh, Henri Bergson said that everything was in process of evolution due to the activity of the life force. Fairly recently, a school of British philosophers has coined the phrase, emergent evolution. They pointed out that uh, in the course of development, new qualities of matter are continually emerging one after the other. But as, they, as to why this should happen, one of the leaders of this school, Professor Samuel Alexander said that it was inexplicable and must be accepted with natural piety. While another of its leaders, Professor C. Lloyd Morgan said that it must be due to some eminent force at work in the world, which he identified with God. Thus in every case, some fantasy, some inexplicable and unpredictable, uh, something inexplicable and unpredictable predictable was conjured up to explain development. And so when they thought about the future, all these bourgeois philosophers of evolution either thought like Hegel, that development had now finished. Hegel taught that the absolute idea was fully realized in the Prussian state. Uh, of which he was a distinguished employee or else regarded the future as unfathomable. And, and I'm reminded of uh, this work uh, uh, done by this man, Fukuyama, uh, who talked about the end of history with the, uh, uh, the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union and, and how uh, what the, this uh, liberal democracy as he defined what's happening with the US uh, has now uh, uh, conquered and that's the, there would be no future development of society. So it sounds very much uh, as what Hegel uh, 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 was able to conclude um, 100 years earlier. Nowadays, they give, up, they give up hope altogether and regard everything, past, present, and future as incomprehensible. The result of forces no one can understand or control. It is the same st story in science, the cosmo cosmo cosmogenist, who studied the evolution of the stars, appealed to a mysterious creation to start the process off. The biologists who studied the evolution of organic life appealed to a series of unpredictable accidents, the random mutations of genes as the basis for the whole process. Such ideas are, however, unscientific. Why? Because they assert that the processes they are supposed to be investigating take place without any cause. True, the assertion is often made on the cloak of so-called scientific objectivity and humility. It is not positively stated that no cause exists, but only that we have at present no clue as to what the cause is, cause if any may be. But such reservations do not materially alter the nature of the theories in question. For the fact remains that to say that matter was created, to say that mutations occur spontaneously, is to say that something happened for no reason without any discoverable cause. <coughs> Excuse me. Such statements do not deserve to be called even provisional scientific hypotheses, but are simply idealist inventions fantasies. Science may not yet know why something happened, but to say that it happened for no reason is to abandon science. A second defect in the evolutionary ideas of most bourgeois thinkers is that they regard the process of evolution as smooth 
continuous and unbroken process. They see the process of transition from one evolutionary stage to another as taking place through a series of gradations without conflict and without any break in continuity. But continuity is not the law of development. On the contrary, periods of smooth, continuous evolutionary development are, in, up, are interrupted by sudden and abrupt changes. The emergence of the new stage in development takes place when the conditions for it have matured by a break in, the, in continuity, by the leap from one state to another. <clears throat> Hegel was first to point this out. <clears throat> With every period of transition, he observed, and we quote Hegel now, it is, <clears throat> it is as in the case of the birth of a child, after a long period of nutrition and silence, the continuity of the gradual growth and size of quantitative change is suddenly cut short by the first breath drawn. There is a break in the process, a qualitative change, and the child is born, unquote. But Marx alone followed up this profound observation of Hegel. As for the ensuing bourgeois thinkers, although the investigation of science and common experience itself clearly demonstrate that de development cannot take place without discontinuity, without abrupt transitions and the leap from one state to another, they have nevertheless in their general theories tried to make unbroken continuity the law of evolution. This prejudice in favor of a smooth line of evolution has gone hand in hand with a liberal belief that capitalist society will evolve smoothly through orderly bourgeois progress, broadening down from precedent to precedent as Tennyson once expressed it. To, to have thought differently about evolution in general would have implied that we would have to think differently about social evolution in particular. And when we look at this, they're talking about the prejudice of, uh, in, in favor of evolution uh, that we have, we come from like uh, uh, bourgeois uh, representatives uh, is, that's uh, what we hear now, you know, like from the democratic socialists. Uh, we hear now from the, uh, 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 the Bernie Sanders, uh, Socialism, that's, it doesn't require this abrupt change, this revolutionary transformation. It just gradually, it just gradually develops and, and, and presents itself to the world. So that's how society is, is uh, being perceived. This is something about the limitations of uh, the ability of uh, the colonizer uh, in understanding the movement uh, in history. Uh, and in terms of uh, how to investigate and how to analyze phenomenon that uh, uh, can is being experienced and can be seen. In fact, you see people who often characterize themselves as revolutionaries are looking for revolutionary conclusions, doing everything they can to put the damper on real uh, change as they're trying to emerge in the world because it threatens their world. I mean, Bernie Sanders' world is threatened uh, as, as much as, as uh, Donald Trump's world. The democratic socialist world uh, is threatened as much as the world of Trump, uh, uh, even of the fascists that they seem, uh, that they suggest that they are opposed to. All of this is changed because uh, the, it's threatened uh, by real uh, uh, the transformation that we are looking for and that we understand to be necessary. And that's the overthrow of the colonial mode of production that has come into existence, that thrust white people uh, if you will, the colonizer into this state of uh, this place of significance that never could have occurred without it. Never, never, never could have occurred. It may have been possible uh, for the different ethnic groups who were constantly in fight, fighting each other on this territory that we now call uh, uh, Europe, uh, one of the, of the others of them to uh, uh, succeed in conquering. Uh, in fact, we've seen that in history that one would take over and, and overturn the other and, and uh, oppress the other, et cetera. But the whole, uh, the emergence of this whole uh, uh, thing that consolidated all of these ethnic uh, groups, these ethnic entities into a single whole with common interests, a common uh, sense of sameness, uh, uh, connected by a common uh, economy that was based on uh, the extraction of uh, value, wealth uh, from those of us who were colonized, uh, uh, that is something, uh, a whole new phenomenon that has emerged in the world and something that each of them, uh, the Sanders and the Trumpers and all the others are opposed to uh, seeing overturned. 
And that's something that the colonized must overturn in order for there to be real progress. And this is the progress for the world as opposed to a certain sector of the population now that characterizes everything that happens with it as the being the most significant thing in the world. Progress is the emergence of capitalism, but capitalism comes about as a consequence of, of killing, destroying, wiping out whole peoples uh, uh, and, and, and negatively impacting on the development of other people in their own interests. Progress uh, is a consequence of the stolen science and wealth, uh, everything. If you look at what they, is being talked about even here with Cornforth, uh, uh, and others who consider themselves Marxists in terms of this place where there's great changes began to happen in the world uh, that, where, that resulted in development of capitalism, et cetera. You're talking about a period uh, that is connected to Europe's uh, colonial conquest of stealing resources, science and everything, and that being now concentrated in Europe uh, 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 along with uh, other forms of development. And it's done so in a fashion that it places breaks and limits on what other peoples uh, can do. So anyway, uh, uh, let's go back uh, to corn for. Uh, uh, so uh, we say that uh, here on page 50, the dialectical materialist concept of, uh, of development, the, the problem of understanding and explaining development in a materialist way, that is in harmony with the facts conceived in their own and not in a fantastic connection is answered by dialectical materialism. And this is the real struggle to, 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 uh, to, in, to, to look at the facts, explaining development in a materialist way in harmony with the facts conceived in their own and not in a fantastic connection. Fantastic is not due to biblical stuff, not due to the roots, not due to horoscopes, not due to uh, some other external force uh, 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 outside of the of the world and and uh, human uh, society that uh, uh, or human related society. Uh, uh, this is how we you know that we have to look at at the facts uh, uh, and uh, you know and not in some fantastic connection. So dialectical materialism considers the universe not as static, not as unchanging but as in continual process of development, you can see how the oppressor uh, would not want to see this kind of change. You would see how even a whole society of oppressor, of, of an oppressor population uh, would, uh, would hate uh, to see change. They want to see stuff static. It means more or less that it stays the same. It means that their, their position uh, in the relationship to the rest of the world uh, remains the same, that they may maintain the power, that they maintain the, uh, their resources, even if every now and then they fight among themselves uh, for this advantage or that advantage, they are fighting among themselves not to overturn uh, the system, but uh, on, in, in the context of an existing system that they want to remain the same, uh, remain the same in terms of, uh, of holding uh, its position in relationship to those uh, that it oppresses and exploits. So in consider, it considers <clears throat> this development. Uh, uh, this is dialectic materialism, considers the universe not as static, not as unchanging, but in continual process of development. It considers this development not as smooth, continuous, and unbroken process, but as a process in which phases of gradual evolutionary change are uh, interrupted by a break in continuity, by the sudden leap from one state to another. And it seeks for the explanation, the driving force of this universal movement, not in inventions of idealist fantasy, but within materialist processes themselves, in the inner contradictions, the opposite conflicting tendencies which are in operation in every process of nature and society. So if we want to understand the development of Europe, not some fanciful notion about some things that's maturing just inside Europe, but we see the connection of what Europe is doing, what is becoming Europe, because it doesn't even exist yet. Europe is in the process of becoming through what? Uh, through colonial slavery, through uh, what they've put forth as uh, these great uh, uh, exercises uh, in adventurous discoveries and things like this. The colonial slavery of the world, uh, 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 bringing the world into a common 
uh, 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 economic uh, and political uh, process, uh, a, a mode of production. This is what has occurred. This is where we look for the explanation. This is what uh, even you know uh, people who uh, uh, projected as being uh, some of those far-seeing, advanced thinkers of uh, of uh, of uh, the 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 uh, colonial uh, within the colonial uh, uh, process, colonial mode of production. Uh, this is something uh, that they are unable uh, to understand and to see. So let's see. Uh, the main ideas of materialist dialectics, which are applied in dealing with the law. The main ideas of materialist dialectics, which are applied in dealing with the laws of development of the real material world, including society, will be the subject of the following chapters. But this is how Lenin summed them, summed them up. Uh, <clears throat> the essential idea of materialist dialectics is, and we're quoting uh, uh, Lenin here, uh, the recognition of the contradictory, mutually exclusive opposite tendencies in all phenomena and processes of nature. This alone furnishes the key to the self-movement of everything in existence. It alone furnishes the key to the leaps, to the breaks in continuity, to the transformation, and to the opposite, to the destruction of the old and emergence of the new. In its proper meaning, dialectics is the study of the contradiction within the very essence of things. Development is the struggle of opposites. Unquote. That was that was Lenin. From Hegel to Marx, where contradiction is at work, there is the force of development. This profound conception was first put forward by Hegel, but he worked it out in an idealist way. According to Hegel, the whole process in the material world and space and time is nothing but the realization of the absolute idea outside space and time. The idea develops through a series of contradictions. And it is this ideal development which manifests itself in the material world. If things in space and time are forced to go through a series of transformations and to arrive and pass away one after the other, that is because they are nothing but the embodiment of a self-contradictory phase of the absolute idea. For Hegel, the development of real things was due to the self-contradictoriness of their concepts, where the concept was self-contradictory, the thing which realized that concept could not be stable, but must eventually negate itself and turn into something else. Thus, instead of the concepts of things being regarded as the reflections of those things in our mind, the things were themselves regarded as nothing but the realization of their concepts. Don't sweat it, don't sweat it, y'all. This is how Engels uh, summed up the materialist criticism of Hegel. Uh, this is Engels now speaking. Hegel was not simply put aside. On the contrary, one started out from his revolutionary side, from the dialectical method, but in, it, but in its Hegelian form, this method was unusable, unusable. According to Hegel, this is Engels still, according to Hegel, dialectics is the self-development of the concept. The absolute concept does not exist, does not only exist, where unknown uh, from eternity, it is also the actual living soul of the whole existing world. According to Hegel, therefore, the dialectical development apparent in nature and history, i.e. the casual interconnection of the progressive movement from the lower to the higher, which asserts itself through all zigzag movements and temporary setbacks, is only a miserable copy of the self-movement of the concept going on from eternity. No one knows where, but all events independently of any thinking human brain. So this ideological reversal had to be done away with. We comprehend, hindered the concepts in our head, heads once more materialistically as images of real things, instead of regarding the real things as images of this or that stage of development of the absolute concept. Thus dialectics reduced itself to the science of the general laws of motion. Uh, both uh, of the external world and of human thought, two sets of laws which are identical in substance, but different in their expressions insofar as the human mind can apply them consciously, while in nature and also up to now, for the most part in human history, these laws assert themselves unconsciously in the form of external necessity in the midst of an endless series of seeming accidents. 
Thereby, the dialectics of the concept itself became merely the conscious reflection of the dialectical motion of the real world and the dialectics of Hegel was placed upon his head or rather turned off his head on which it was standing before and placed on its feet again. In this way, however, the revolutionary side of Hegelian philosophy was again taken up and at the same time free from the idealist trammels which in Hegel's hands had prevented this consistent execution. And uh, effectively, you know, what they're talking about is how Hegel, you know, uh, was pretty hip and uh, when it came to uh, recognizing the existence of dialectics and, uh, and contribute uh, a lot uh, from their perspective and, and, and how we understand uh, uh, certain movements uh, 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 in history, in society, et cetera. The problem was that Hegel saw all of this um, as reflecting uh, uh, a relationship with some absolute idea uh, 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 as that it's ongoing uh, uh, development maturation and things like that, which reduced it to uh, an, an absolute idea of the force, the, the force, uh, uh, God, uh, et cetera, you know, all, uh, you know, fit within the same uh, kind of definition. It was some external force that was responsible for uh, what, uh, uh, for what was making, uh, what was emerging and, act, and being activated in the world. And uh, this is what uh, uh, made, uh, 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 Hegel's uh, uh, dialectics, uh, 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 idealist uh, dialectics, as opposed to a materialist uh, uh, dialectics. And this is what Marx and, and Engels were fighting against. This is what Cornforth um, is uh, helping us to understand. And the only thing about this uh, that I think is really important uh, is that uh, exposing uh, various means through which uh, philosophical idealism continuously uh, 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 struggles to intrude uh, into how the world is being uh, experienced and understood. And, uh, you know, we know about gods and we know about, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, you know uh, various other kinds of, uh, of, of, of things that uh, are substitute for materialist uh, assessment. Uh, and here, talking about uh, uh, Hegel, you know, just another uh, expression of this uh, external force that uh, does not require uh, for an understanding of the world and an investigation of the world itself. Uh, it allows uh, uh, the world to be understood as a consequence of, uh, of some action or some activity that has been imposed on it from, uh, from outside. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so we say that the materialist understanding dialectics is the key to understand the forces of development within the material world itself without recourse to outside causes. This discovery arises from the whole advance of science and philosophy. But above all, it arises from the investigation of the laws of society, an investigation made imperative thanks to the very development of society. From the discovery of the, the contradictions of capitalism explaining the forces of social development and thereby showing the way forward from capitalism to socialism. And uh, it's really interesting here. And this is something that we should really keep in mind as we understand, uh, as we begin to understand uh, African internationalism and, uh, uh, and even uh, what we're talking about in terms of uh, actually uh, colonialism being a mode of production, uh, something that, uh, uh, the Marxists and something that the uh, all of those who lived and benefited from uh, this colonial mode of production uh, were incapable of understanding and 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 what is necessary for Africans and other colonized people to understand, and it's necessary for everybody to understand uh, if we are going to uh, destroy a social system based on exploitation. Um, that an oppressive uh, social system based on exploitation move toward the future. And the future requires us to destroy the colonial mode of production. That is the only way that we will liberate all the forces of production in the whole world uh, and, and, um, and allow us to move forward uh, to, uh, with the new world that our struggle will, is in the process of creating uh, even now. <clears throat> 
So uh, th that is why uh, bourgeois thinkers saying here that um, that uh, uh, above all, that is to say, uh, the materialist understanding of dialectics is the key to understanding the forces of development within the material world itself without recourse to outside causes. This discovery arises from the whole advance of science and philosophy, but above all, it arises from the investigation of the laws of society, an investigation made imperative thanks to the very development of society, from the discovery of the contradictions of capitalism, explaining the forces of social development and thereby showing the way forward from capitalism to socialism. That is why bourgeois thinkers cannot answer the problem of explaining the real material forces of development in nature and society. To answer this problem was to condemn the capitalist system. And here they had a blind spot. Only the revolutionary philosophy of the vanguard of the revolutionary class, the working class could do it. Marx's discovery of the laws of materialist dialectics showed us how to understand the dialectic and development of nature. But above all, it showed us how to understand social change and how to wage the working class struggle for socialism. This discovery revolutionized philosophy. And the truth of the matter is we will say that about African internationalism because all of what Marx is talking about is uh, activity that exists within the um, uh, within the colonial capitalist social system that came uh, 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 with the, uh, the, the uh, as an advance uh, for Europe uh, 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 and uh, through the destruction of feudalism, which had uh, locked uh, European, uh, uh, what would be uh, the development of, of Europe uh, uh, into a place that it could, could not move forward, couldn't move forward. Uh, uh, the relations of production uh, 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 no longer fit the requirements of, of, of this emerged new mode of production, uh, which was a colonial uh, mode of production. So uh, from the Marxist point of view, uh, this discovery, according to Cornforth, revolutionized philosophy. It signalized the triumph of materialism over idealism by doing away with the limitations of the merely me mechanistic materialism of the past. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the merely mechanistic uh, mat uh, materialism of the past has not yet been overturned. And that's what African internationalism does. Uh, uh, and and uh, this discovery uh, put forth, uh, as Cornforth is saying, it likewise spelled the end of all so-called system systems of philosophy. It made philosophy into a revolutionary weapon of the working people, an instrument, a method of understanding the world so as to change it. Summing up the essential ideas of materialist dialectic, Stalin wrote, quote, life always contains the new and the old, the growing and the dying, the revolutionary and the counter-revolutionary. That in life which is born and grows day after day is invincible. Its progress cannot be checked. That is to say, if, for example, the proletariat as a class is born and grows day after day, no matter how weak it may be today, in the long run, it must conquer. Why? because it is growing, gaining strength and marching forward. On the other hand, that in life which grows old and is advancing to its grave must inevitably sustain defeat, even if today it represents a titanic force. That is to say, if for example, the ground is gradually slipping further and further back from under the feet of the bourgeoisie and the ladder is slipping further and further back every day, no matter how strong it may be, it may appear, be today, it must in the long run sustain defeat. And this is what we say about colonialism. And it, 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 clearly we can see the ground is, is slipping from uh, further and further from under its feet every day. Even the so-called uh, 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 towers, the twin towers collapsed. That, that was one of the most glaring uh, 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 statements of, of the fact that the colonial contradiction I was intruding into this, the, what was considered the safest space uh, in the colonial uh, capitalist world, uh, in the US, et cetera. And so I say, thus the materialistic uh, dialectics of Marx shows us the way forward and gives us unshakable confidence in our cause. Uh, so uh, comrade uh, uh, director, how should we move at this point? Mr. Chairman, I think this is a good place to stop. Okay, and this is uh, what page uh, 50, what? Four. 54. Okay. All right, so let's stop at page 54 and uh, see where we at. All right, Uhuru Chairman. Uh -oh. um, 
I really want to, I didn't want to stop the study. I really want to appreciate and just salute this really profound study. And, you know, you breaking down these points um, again, to the point where, you know, we are able to internalize what it is that you're saying. And um, yeah, so we're going to pick up on um, point six, dialectics and metaphysics, but um, this is our Q&A portion now. If you have not typed in your question, go ahead and type that into the Facebook or YouTube description. And while you are typing your questions, we're going to go ahead into our announcements. Got some things going on. All right, so this study is being brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, Winning the War of Ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspear.com. And we encourage everyone watching today, if you are not already subscribed to the Burning Spear newspaper, get a one-year subscription today. 12 issues delivered straight to your door for $25 or the digital edition delivered to your email inbox. Get a combo of both for 20% off. You can also gift the subscription to comrades and family members and donate to sponsor prisoner subscription. You can do all of this at theburningspear.com slash subscribe. Amali Taught Me airs on Black Power 96 FM radio, a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund with the slogan, not just explaining the world, but changing it. Listen on 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida, or streaming online at blackpower96.org or on the free Black Power 96 mobile app. The theory of African internationalism is a theory of practice. All the energy of the African People's Socialist Party is focused on the destruction of colonial capitalism. Africans of the world, go to our website, apspuhuru.org, and fill out our contact form. Give the gift of African internationalism. Visit burningsparemarketplace.com for books and literature by Chairman Amalia Shetela and other Uhuru movement leaders. Check out the pamphlet section with reissued and vintage pamphlets, including The New Period and Smash Slander, which have been discussed in previous Omali Taught Me studies and Report from the Mountain. These are critical African internationalist texts that are still relevant today. Check out the new Thinking About Uhuru hat and stock up on your African flags. Go to burningspearmarketplace.com. If you are in Oakland, California area, come to the Uhuru Furniture Warehouse sale today, December 12th, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., taking place in the beautiful Aquaba Hall at 7911 MacArthur Boulevard, Oakland. Uhuru Furniture will be moving our overflow furniture to a new warehouse space so that Aquaba Hall can be reopened for community events, meetings, and a rental space for receptions, showers, and more. Help us celebrate one last dance at the amazing Aquaba Hall this Sunday, December 12th from 10 to 4 p.m. with a very special 50% off all furniture, lamps, rugs, and mirrors, as well as hundreds of framed artwork pieces, all for just $1 each. Join a two-part online study hosted by the Uhuru Solidarity Movement Midwest Region discussing the book, the Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States by Walter Johnson. The first session will be this coming Wednesday, December 15th at 6 p.m. Central Time. African People's Solidarity Committee Chair Penny Hess leads a discussion on the book and the history of St. Louis through African internationalism. From the truth about the 1804 L Lewis and Clark colonial expedition to the 2014 rebellions in Ferguson after the police murder of Mike Brown to the building of the Black Power Blueprint today. Register for this study at tinyurl.com slash study B-H-O-A. Calling on all party and Uhuru movement members and supporters, attend the 2022 plenary conference of the African People's Socialist Party, February 11th through the 14th. 2022-themed relentless 50 years of leadership towards African redemption. Our plenaries and congresses have become the vehicles for an ongoing assessment of our work and the conditions in the world affecting our struggle for total liberation and unification of every square inch of Africa and the entire globally dispersed African nation. Registration for this four-day virtual conference costs just $25.00. Read the full call to attend by Chairman Amalia Shetela and register by going to APSPplenary.org. Like and follow the Loise Kinshasa like page on Facebook for more African internationalist political education. Secretary General Loise Kinshasa does frequent live events such as the War of Ideas series. He includes live sessions done in French. To get alerts of when SG Loise is going live, make sure to like and follow his page today. 
Uhuru, Fides, Uhuru Foods and Pies is hiring for a part-time baker in both Oakland, California and St. Petersburg, Florida. Culinary training is preferred. Join the work to build an independent African economy by baking for Black power. To apply, email your resume to oakland.volunteer at uhurufoods.org or mail your resume to 7911 MacArthur Boulevard, Oakland, California, 94605 or call 800-578-5157 for more information. Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles in both Oakland and Philly are hiring full-time truck drivers and full-time marketing coordinators. Do you have driving and furniture lifting skills, social media and print marketing experience, and can you work Wednesday through Sunday? If so, apply for these positions and contribute your labor and skills to this institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Apply by visiting our website in Oakland, uhurufurniture.blogspot.com. And in Philadelphia, that's Uhuru Furniture Philly .blogspot.com. On Tuesday nights from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern, join Ralph Pointer on What's Happening Blog Talk Radio. Tune in by calling 347-857-3293. Ralph Pointer sits on the Black is Back Coalition Steering Committee and chairs the BIBC's Political Prisoners Working Group and also leads the Lynn Stewart Committee. And we're also calling on people to follow the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project on Facebook or visit developmentforafrica.org for important information and helpful tips in regards to the colonial virus COVID-19. APDEP launched an international telehealth program, a free resource for African people to get our COVID-19 related questions and concerns answered by licensed doctors and nurses through Project Black Ankh. You can make your free virtual health appointment with one of their professional health providers by going to developmentforafrica.org slash telehealth. To keep up with our movement events, visit the burningspear.com's events page and subscribe to our mailing list. And last announcement, make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spear TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me Sunday Study and support the Omali Taught Me show by donating now at paypal.me slash Omali Taught Me. So that's it for this week's announcements. Thank you guys for your patience. And now we're going to get into the Q&A portion of our program. Chairman, we have two questions from last week. And then we'll get into this week's questions. I, of course, want to acknowledge where people are tuning in from. We have St. Louis, Missouri, Huntsville, Alabama, Portland, Oregon, St. Petersburg, Florida, Moorhead, Minnesota, Winter Springs, Florida, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Chicago, Illinois, Oakland, California, Los Angeles, California, Pinellas Park, Florida, Ghana, San Diego, California, Gainesville, Florida, Jamaica, Greenville, South Carolina, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Lakeland, Florida, Everton West, Occupied Azania or South Africa, Marion County, Georgia, Delaware, Hempstead, New York, Swaziland, Nigeria, Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia, Battle Creek, Michigan, and Fort Myers, Florida. So thank you all for tuning in wherever you're located. So Chairman, um, our first question that came in from last week um, came from a account on YouTube called Word from the Point, and they asked, would APSP prohibit the use of cannabis slash hemp once in power? That's, that's the question. I want to uh, appreciate the questions from Comrade uh, Word from the Point because it does anticipate that we come into power. And that's uh, obviously a real uh, growing apprehension uh, or comprehension of the whole question of, of historical materialism that makes that prediction for us. First of all, I just want to say that um, when we look at uh, cannabis or the various other things that uh, it's referred to, its significance uh, today and, and our party is opposed to the uh, utilization of uh, cannabis within uh, the party. And that uh, is based primarily on the fact that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, we are materialists. And, and, and the reality is that uh, under the conditions that African people live today and most of the world live today, uh, that the uh, use of cannabis is a way that uh, Africans and others, uh, whether uh, consciously or, or not, and mostly not consciously, and no pun intended, um, are engaged in uh, um, uh, uh, trying to deal with the uh, uh, contradictions of colonial capitalism, that we live as a suffering, uh, oppressed people uh, uh, every day. And some people have referred to it as a form of self-medication. Uh, that we engage in not just cannabis, but other 
forms of drugs too that uh, I would include alcohol and 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 other things to be uh, a part of. And uh, but the problem is not us. The problem is the social system itself, the nature of the social system, the oppressive nature of the social system, and that uh, uh, the, the the reason we are opposed to the utilization, the use of cannabis. Uh, in our part in our movement is because we are materialists and understand that the problem is in the world and not in us. And that our, our responsibility is to change this world uh, that we live in so that we don't have to find the means of uh, artificial means uh, uh, making it uh, something uh, uh, that we can endure, that's uh, acceptable. Why endure an oppressive uh, kind of world as opposed to be actively engaged in trying to overturn it. So I cannot answer uh, that question um, uh, right now beyond that, that uh, the thing is to eradicate the need uh, or the uh, uh, resumed need uh, for uh, uh, medicating ourselves to be able to deal with this social system. And the fact of the matter is, regardless of what people may be thinking that everything that we do happens within the context of trying to, uh, of having to exist uh, and, and prosper or, or simply to exist uh, uh, within the social system, within this social system. In any social system, the same thing is true, that, uh, uh, that the things that we do uh, 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 are contextualized by, by the system that we're living in. And it's oppressive and horrible uh, for Africans and other oppressed people. Uh, so that's that's where I can go with that at this moment, and uh, so we're not in, in favor of it. We are not uh, some. We are not an organization that will come up with a, uh, some other uh, reason for the state to lock people up to criminalize people. So we don't uh, come out saying don't decriminalize uh, marijuana or something to that effect. We're saying that uh, this this is a different. This is a uh, an issue that the African revolutionary has to revolution uh, has to see uh, as as something that uh, is significant in terms of overturning a whole social system, and uh, and that's that's about where we can go with it right now, uh, comrade. Uh, world word from the point. Udo. I heard chairman. Thank you, and thank you. Word from the word from the point for your question. Um, and the last question that came in from last week came from Comrade King L in Philadelphia. He asked, Ahuru Chairman and comrades, thank you for the study and the very profound explanations to the questions raised. My question is, if we recognize that colonized people throughout the world are under the oppression of white power through world capitalism, colonial and neo-colonial rule, etc., why does the party not bring into its ranks colonized people that do not recognize or self-identify as Africans, yet recognize that they are colonized by white power, such as indigenous people of the so-called Americas, Indians from India and Asians of all stripes, Afghanis, Pakistanis, Persians, Palestinians, so on and so on. Uh, Comrade Kenya, we do and have always uh, uh, engaged uh, in struggle with these comrades against the common enemy. But the reality is that the way the colonial capitalism uh, has emerged, it has uh, 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 captured uh, whole peoples and created various kinds of structures, uh, uh, political, economic, even ideological structures uh, uh, to define those relationships, borders and things like that. And we have come uh, to uh, 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 experience uh, our oppression in relationship to these structures uh, as, as well. And so uh, we uh, recognize that uh, African people are going to have to be free as a people, uh, that African people have to become conscious of our existence and our oppression as a people, and that we have an extraordinary capacity for helping to organize and bring people, African people, into organization as a people, and that the examples that we set and the relationships that we develop in the process of doing that with other peoples who are also suffering from uh, colonial oppression uh, is the way forward to destroying this world that's based uh, 
uh, that's organized around uh, these uh, false borders uh, and separate people from each other and from our resources. So the ultimate aim is to create a world without borders. Uh, but to create a world without borders, we are going to have to organize uh, the people who uh, are capable of immediately of recognizing themselves as being a part uh, of the same uh, uh, process. And, uh, and, and, and Africans uh, and, and indigenous people, we have our, our own individual uh, set of contradictions and circumstances imposed on us by colonial capitalism uh, that will inform uh, the means, the process by which the tactics and strategies to some extent uh, uh, through what that we use in order to overturn uh, this system in the process of building uh, uh, the kind of unity in the, in the world that we are looking for, which is a world without borders. But that's uh, that, the, uh, that Africans are gonna have to do this and other people are gonna have to do this and we will do it increasingly in concert with each other. And what we're gonna see is uh, even as the revolution inside places like the United States unfolds, uh, where we have uh, a, a domestic colony in the form of African people. We have settler colonialism in terms of what has happened to indigenous peoples here. Uh, uh, we're going to see that this whole process of, uh, of fighting for our liberation is going to, even in the process of uh, struggle, transform the relationship that we have with each other, transform the relationship the, of how this transform uh, the relationships developed in the process of overturning our oppression and transform uh, what we understand uh, national liberation will look like. Uh, so uh, my simple explanation, uh, Comrade King L, uh, is that we are working toward the world without borders, uh, but we recognize the world as it is. And uh, to get to where we need to be, we have to be able to organize Africans as Africans and work in solidarity with other uh, colonized people who recognize, as you've suggested, the fact that they are colonized and that we're engaged in a common struggle. So King L, I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, King L, for your question. And now we are moving it to questions that have come in today. The first one being from Comrade Asada, and she asks, what do you think of the concept Quote, religion and revolution don't mix. Religion seeks to divide us, but the revolution seeks to unite us, unquote. People often label faith as religion. Well, religion, that's what we've been talking about now when we talk about the whole question of materialism uh, and dialectics. That when you look at this whole issue of uh, religion, uh, you're looking at a philosophical, at philosophical idealism. Uh, and uh, it is something that uh, seeks explanations for our oppression, our conditions of existence and some, uh, some uh, external force uh, that you cannot uh, come to uh, the best conclusions uh, by, uh, except by investigating the world. And that's what materialism requires us to do. That's what uh, the difference in, in materialist, uh, materialism and, and idealism, that we wanna understand the world, we investigate the world. We wanna understand some religions, uh, idealism, we can investigate idealism, we can investigate the Bible, but don't think that you're gonna understand the world through investigating religion, the Bible, Quran, or any other entity such as that. You, we are materialists, which means that we come to an understanding of the world by the investigation of the world itself. And the world is something that we can experience through the, through the, <clears throat> through the senses and one way or, or, or another. So, uh, uh, in terms of whether religion and revolution mix or not, uh, the point is that, that uh, to make um, uh, the revolution uh, that will change the world uh, that we uh, involved in doing, it's going to have to be based on materialism and not idealism uh, that may call itself spiritualism or religion or something to that effect. So, uh, Kermit Asatja, I hope that was helpful. Uhuru. Uhuru, yes, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Asada for your question. The next one comes from, uh, we have a few from uh, Occupied Azania comrades. Uh, Asa's question being, uh, can you speak to what is an absolute idea and can you say what a revolutionary class is? Thank you, Chairman. Uh -huh. An absolute idea that, that Hegel talked about is just another way of saying the same old thing. Uh, it's the God, it's the absolute, it's this total uh, uh, it is an explanation of uh, a phenomena of, of the world uh, 
being uh, coming to existence through some other uh, process. In the beginning, there was the word, and the word was God. Uh, That's an absolute idea. It's a uh, it's a an unscientific uh, assessment, especially when you recognize that the thing about that makes a, a philosophical uh, position scientific is this falsifiability, and you can't falsify that. How can you uh, prove or disprove an absolute idea? Uh, so to say uh, that's what the abs an absolute idea is just uh, um, another iteration of uh, of God, the external power, some other force outside of society that's making the determination. Of it. what was the other aspect of comment Asa's question? It was. Um, can you say what a revolutionary class is? A, a revolutionary class is that uh, class that is. Uh, 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 fundamental, critical, central to uh, the overturning of uh, an existing uh, social system uh, and, uh, and the uh, uh, emergence of a, a new social system. The revolution is overturning. So some people like to refer to revolution as change, but revolution is more than change. A revolution is that great leap that we've talked about uh, during this study up to now. It is a movement from just quantitative change, growth and, 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 and lack of growth of fast. And it's a whole new situation. And so overturning the social system, the critical uh, forces necessary, and we can identify some forces necessary for bringing about revolution. A revolutionary class is that class that is critical, fundamental, and necessary for the overturning of a social system and bringing to existence uh, another social system. And we've identified that class uh, is, the, uh, uh, is the African working class or the, the, the working class within the uh, oppressed uh, colonized uh, uh, nation. Uh, in fact, we've, we've uh, extended that discussion to say that uh, when we look at uh, that the class question is concentrated in the colonial question. And we see that the whole uh, fundamental social system rests, its, rests itself. Uh, on the oppressive exploitation of the colonized. So the colonized African working class uh, represents the, uh, that revolutionary class. And you can have other classes who uh, uh, are in motion and, and sometimes in struggle against a social system and uh, sometimes succeed in overturning a, a social system, uh, but, uh, uh, but not bring, not, or, or I should say government which is different from uh, overturning a social system. Governments can be overturned and overthrown and, and uh, you simply replace one government resting uh, on, uh, on top of a, within a social system by another government within a social system. That's what uh, January 6th in the United States when a group of white people attacked uh, the, uh, the US Congress with the intent of overturning the government but the social system they wanted to protect uh, was a colonial capitalist uh, socialist system. And in fact, they attacked the government because they didn't think the government uh, was doing everything to protect their interests within the colonial capitalist social system. So Kermit Asa, uh, the, the revolutionary class is that class that is fundamental, that is central, that is necessary for overturning a social system and, and uh, historically determined uh, uh, necessary uh, to overturning a social system and bring into existence another Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman, for breaking that down. And thank you, Asa, for that question. And um, again, from Occupy Design, we have Carmen Nasiki Lelo. Uh, given the dialectic of oppressor nations versus oppressor nations, would you say that Europe is a coincidence that materializes from the attack on Africa? A coincidence that materialized from the attack on Africa. Mm -hmm. I would say Europe was born from the attack on Africa, that there was no Europe before then. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was just these warring tribes of white people uh, who were contending with each other, who defined themselves primarily in relationship to each other. That it was uh, the attack on Africa initially, and then uh, an attack that, uh, 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 that would include uh, other peoples around the world who uh, uh, came to live under colonial domination uh, that gave birth uh, to uh, to Europe. It was this time, this thing that these uh, uh, separate and uh, warring and contending warring tribes uh, began to achieve a sense of sameness. And that sense of sameness that came about 
uh, through uh, uh, being united uh, uh, around these economic interests of slavery and uh, uh, and and uh, brigandage, uh, and then it also it began to be colored, if you will, no pun intended or, or pun intended, uh, ideologically uh, uh, by what came to be characterized as race and black people and other people and sitting on the top of this uh, the colonial heap uh, has been white people, the colonizer. So uh, Europe uh, and, and Europe itself, you know, they, in, in, in Paris, there's a, a, a museum used to be called something like the Museum of the Colonies. Um, and um, uh, it's interesting, I've, I've been there and they've changed the name now to something the uh, uh and, and they have this, um, uh, this, uh, I've, I don't know what you call this, where you have sculptured into walls. You have these pictures uh, sculptured into to the walls that show uh, peoples uh, from around the world, uh, Vietnamese, Africans, and what have you, carrying uh, resources, booty, uh, loot, et cetera, uh, from all around the world and, and, and sitting atop this whole, is this uh, very plump, uh, uh, European uh, person uh, 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 that is uh, either that is Europe uh, or France. I can't even remember if it's Europe or France, but it's something that clearly shows uh, how uh, the resources of the world came to uh, give gave birth to this thing that we that we know as Europe. And this was something that was that Europeans were conscious of. It's it's only later that uh, it has become. Uh, a, a, a kind of an embarrassment, uh, uh, something, an albatross around, a historical albatross around the neck of Europe uh, that they would uh, try to obscure. Uh, but it, they, Europe was quite conscious of the fact uh, that it came about, it was born uh, as a consequence of, of robbing and looting Africa in particular and other peoples around the world. So uh, you say it was a coincidence uh, saying that uh, it is the thing that gave birth uh, to Europe. Uh, colonialism, colonial slavery, colonialism uh, is what gave birth uh, to Europe. Europe exists as a consequence, as, a, as an entity, as a concept of, of rape and pillage. In fact, uh, the political report that I'm working on now uh, will quote for this uh, plenary that's coming up in February, will quote extensively uh, uh, evidence that shows uh, just where Europe came from. And uh, it came from uh, looting us, killing us. And it's, it's maintained as a consequence of uh, keeping this, that all the suffering, all the misery that we see in a, in a, uh, a materially uh, rich, uh, what they call South Africa, all the misery uh, that we see there, all the, uh, the fears of uh, COVID and other kinds of disease imposed upon us, all the horrible human beings that come in, that's come into existence or understanding that they have some uh, inherent right uh, to murder, to rape, uh, and to loot, uh, loot us, all of it uh, came from, uh, uh, from uh, this process of, and is maintained by this process of uh, the colonial mode of production. It is what gave birth to the thing that we call Europe now. And uh, we have a responsibility to, to take it down, to erase, to destroy, uh, this relationship and and it's going to be good for the whole world um but uh so that's my response i know I've, i said quite a bit there and i hope it was helpful Uhuru. Uhuru chairman um and again that was uh comrade nancy kilelo um nancy yes. okay Uhuru. Uh, so thank you for your question um our next question comes from comrade timba in st louis missouri he asked, her chairman, really appreciate this clarity. You mentioned that Marx was born into a world where colonialism was the mode of production. How does this fact hamper the pursuit of liberation for colonized African people? The fact that Marx was born into uh, 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 <clears throat> a system where colonialism was the mode of production, it doesn't hamper us except that some people have been confused, but there are various things that's confused the colonized. The fact is, when you live under colonial domination, uh, it is the uh, the rulers who uh, actually define the world that we live in. Uh, we've uh, been trapped by definitions of our oppression, our existence, by 
by those who have colonized us, who dominate and live, live uh, at our expense uh, historically. And so uh, the thing that makes, uh, that's what makes this important, what we are doing today. That's what makes the African People's Socialist Party important and significant. That's what makes uh, uh, the creation of an actual uh, uh, working class, revolutionary working class intellectuals so important because we cut through all of that garbage and nonsense that's, that's being passed on to us as, as history and science and, uh, uh, and, and what is a real. We discovered reality. We use the scientific methods of historical, uh, dialectic historical uh, materialist investigation. We use that method uh, for our own purposes uh, and uh, to uh, investigate the world as it relates to us. Uh, and we come to different kinds of conclusions. And when we come to these conclusions, we are mad as hell. I remember uh, Comrade Timber when, uh, when I was a very young person and uh, I actually uh, uh, joined the U.S. military, um, trying to uh, escape from uh, what I thought was uh, a life of oppression uh, that was imposed on me because I was living in a small uh, a, a, a southern city in St. Petersburg, Florida. I, I knew better. I should have known better. But anyway, going into this thing, uh, I learned so much in the process from the very moment I I went into that entity from throughout the entire process, the learning process, traveling around the world and seeing how uh, this oppression uh, executed itself and seeing how uh, being in Germany when the Berlin Wall was going up and we were taught about the horrors of communism, this kind of thing, being in tanks facing uh, Russians who had never done a damn thing to me. Uh, and then hearing while I'm there, uh, some uh, a British officer who was, who was involved in killing black people in Congo <clears throat> at the same time uh, when the Mumba had led this, uh, this movement for our independence and that the United Nations and all these forces went in there to crush it. And then the Africans who were just trying to register to become a part of the Democratic Party of the United States, which is a colonial party, a Democratic Party that participated in killing the Mumba, that participated in overthrowing Nkrumah and all this stuff. And then uh, as in, 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 uh, and then recognizing, uh, you know, what I had come from in the United States and seeing all this stuff, I came back to the United States. I was so, I was, I was so angry for being had, for being duped, uh, and and dragged into this horrible relationship under the <clears throat> the leadership of uh, of the very same forces who were killing and oppressing us everywhere. And I think that uh, as African people become conscious of, uh, of our reality and become African internationalists, uh, achieve a scientific uh, understanding of the world the way it really is, you're going to have more and more Africans who, uh, will, uh, who uh, uh, will be uh, as angry as I and uh, motivated now uh, having access to the science that I have access to. Uh, uh, historical materialist understanding and what have you, and knowing that the future belongs to us and be willing to commit uh, themselves to overturning this relationship, this system. So uh, uh, the, what Marx understood uh, is one thing, but when we understand the question of the colonial mode of production, then we are not trapped by what Marx thought or what anybody else thought. Uh, we are informed in some instances by some conclusions that they came to that might uh, be uh, helpful in terms of reinforcing uh, 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 our own uh, understanding of the world or, or, or not. So uh, that's what I would say to that comrade, Chemba Uhura. Uhura, thank you, uh, Chairman. And thank you, Timber, for your question. And he does have another one, but we'll take it after everybody gets um, their question in. So this wasn't really a question, but I thought it was an important comment um, because it's still uh, dealing with this question of religion. Um, so this comment was from Sefu, who is located in Queens, New York, who said Kwame Nkrumah said in his autobiography that he was a Christian and a Marxist and, it, and there was no contradiction in it. So I just wanted to see if we could speak to that. <laughs> well, I, I love uh, Nkrumah. He was a remarkable person, but Nkrumah didn't even understand the class question until after he was overthrown. And, uh, and I'm not saying this to belittle Nkrumah. Uh, in fact, I think he was one of the most important uh, figures uh, in, in, our, in the history of our revolution. 
uh, and as was Garvey, and, and, and uh, who I think was incredibly significant, as was Malcolm. And all uh, three of them had uh, uh, some, uh, were informed uh, to some extent uh, uh, by philosophical idealism that we might refer to as religion. In fact, uh, one of the things that uh, comment on in the political report that I'm working on for the upcoming uh, 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 plenary of the party uh, is uh, how uh, important Garvey was, fundamentally important in terms of introducing materialist uh, philosophy uh, to African people about Africa. And we say that that was true despite the fact uh, that he raised the slogan, one Africa, no, one, one, one God, uh, one something, one destiny. And uh, because in, in that, uh, uh, the slogans that he put forth, uh, you find the, the essence, the, the essential uh, materialist recognition of the contradiction that we are confronted with. One Africa, one people, you know, uh, uh, Africa for Africans at home and abroad, I mean, there's critical uh, philosophical conclusions that uh, <clears throat> people who may have considered them, who did consider themselves Marxists and other things were not able uh, to come to and that helped to change the world. And so I'm saying that, uh, that Nkrumah, uh, uh, the significance of Nkrumah as profound as it was could have been much greater uh, had he not been uh, trapped by philosophical idealism. And I know that there are some people uh, and Nkrumah may have been one of them who believed that uh, they had to uh, profess uh, religion in order to, uh, uh, to be able to be accepted by masses of African people who were uh, uh, locked into superstition and, 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 and various uh, other uh, forms of, uh, uh, of philosophical idealism. Uh, uh, but uh, we are creating an army of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, working class uh, intellectuals who uh, will be able uh, to, through African internationalism, have possession of an historical materialist uh, explanation of the world and our place and destiny in that world. And it will not rely on any explanation from external forces, from spooks and, and uh, otherworldly uh, forces and creatures, Uhuru. That was Seifu, Seifu? Yes. Uhuru, mm -hmm. Comrade Seifu, Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. Um, and our next question comes from Comrade Afua on let me, YouTube. Let me say this, the, the whole thing, you know, like for, for so many people, religion is sort of like Santa Claus. Uh, uh, I mean, it has the same origin and same basis in terms of a certain kind of ignorance, but it's comforting and, and uh, you know, what should comfort us is uh, an absolutely uh, materialist worldview that, that, that can make and allow us, a dialectical historical materialist worldview that can allow us to see the end, to see the victory of our revolutionary movement to overturn the social system. And it's not good enough to just define comfort uh, 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 within the uh, circumstances of our oppression, which is what religion offers uh, for, for a lot of people. And uh, I just, I wanna say that because I'm not saying that religion doesn't make some people comfortable. So, wow, you know, I can do this because I'm now comfortable. In fact, religion has uh, been used to, for people to endure a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, and sometimes that includes oppression and repression, et cetera. Uh, uh, but the fact is that religion and superstition will not free us and will not bring us to the conclusions that we have to come to. Uh, will always be something ultimately that will be used against the people, that keeps the people smothered uh, in ignorance and keeps the people uh, uh, incapable of perceiving our real capacity as human beings. Uh, requiring instead a reliance on some external force uh, that's out there who we constantly appease by the number of times and the directions that we pray and, and the candles that we light and other things like that, uh, <clears throat> where we should be uh, lighting uh, fuses uh, 
uh, to deal with our oppressors, we are lighting uh, candles to appease an oppressive entity that's uh, uh, overworldly and what have you. <clears throat> so, say uh, for yeah, Uhuru. You were going someplace, comment director. You were saying some other person. Uhuru, uh, yep, just going to the next question, comrade Afua on YouTube um, asked, can the chairman comment on the UN's international decade for people of African descent? The world is unaware of this declaration, quite strategic in my view. Well, uh, is that Afua? Afu? I, I don't think that's, I don't know. Afua, you'd have to say if you are Afua comrade in Ghana. Um, I'm not sure. You didn't say where they're located. Let, let me uh, just say that the United Nations uh, it was created for the very same <clears throat> reason that the League of Nations was created. The League of Nations came about as a consequence of a treaty that ended this first imperialist world war to, to, to divide the world, to redivide the world. Uh, white power, white people, colonizers have been struggling uh, for possession of, uh, of the world uh, for a long period of time. And so uh, the first imperialist world war, uh, the League of Nations came about as a consequence of uh, the ending of that war. Treaties that were, uh, came about at Versailles uh, uh, that forced, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Germany's uh, 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 subsequent uh, uh, subservience to uh, the rest of the, uh, of, the, of the colonial powers took German, quote unquote, German territory and shared it out among each other, et cetera and then created this thing called the League of Nations. <clears throat> and the League of Nations was supposed to be an instrument to make sure that peace was always there, et cetera. Uh, uh, and what it did really was create uh, this uh, uh, superstructure, a part of a superstructure, a legal uh, instrument, uh, uh, a political instrument that uh, would allow uh, the colonial powers to capitalist colonial colonial capitalist power uh, to be able to dominate the world and to make decisions about such domination <clears throat> that would not require them to fight and kill each other over who was going to get what. Then the second imperialist world war uh, uh, that uh, because the United States has <clears throat> although Woodrow Wilson who was president of the United States at the time of the League of Nations who was the driving force to create it uh, could not win that uh, within the U.S. and especially the U.S. Congress, so it could not participate in the in that. And so the Second World War uh, to divide the world uh, with this ending, the United Nations was created, and what uh, is uh, more or less the world order uh, that is crumbling, crumbling right now, and that's where it came from. And it was also a part of a process to make it unnecessary. Uh, for colonial powers, for Europeans more or less, to kill each other in order to take the loot and resources from the rest of the world. If you look at even the structure of that institution, you see that it was created uh, with the idea uh, that the, co the colonial white powers would dominate the world and would make all the decisions uh, critical to the world. And with the appearance of some kind of democracy, despite the fact that veto powers was given to the top dogs, uh, and only recently were some other forces able to intrude into this veto capacity, uh, uh, et cetera. So when you talk about the, the, the United Nations having made some kind of declaration about uh, the year of, uh, how was it characterized? Uh, the era of the decade or something that uh, supposed to recognize some significance of Africa. Uh, this is something uh, that was determined not to overturn of the colonial system and our relationship to it, uh, uh, but in many ways to, uh, uh, to, uh, to make it more acceptable uh, by coming up with clever declarations like that it doesn't end the poverty, it doesn't end the oppression, it doesn't end neocolonialism, it doesn't end the fact uh, that the majority of the resources in Africa continue to be owned by colonial powers who were able uh, to sign on to some United Nations declarations about the year or the decade of Africa or something like that uh, without unleashing, without turning loose any of those resources. And Africa continues to be uh, divided uh, uh, by these uh, illegitimate borders uh, that came uh, uh, into existence in part uh, through machinations of some of the same imperialist forces who 
uh, uh, control this institution that's called the United Nations and that uh, right now, even if shakily is controlled by the United States. And so uh, that's what I would say about that, uh, that Africans still are gonna have to win our freedom and we're gonna have to fight for it. And no declaration that comes from some institution that came into existence as a part of a superstructure of a global uh, colonial capitalist system, no declaration coming from them is going to change that. And so uh, even if they give us another holiday or two uh, or something to that effect, even uh, that will not change reality, the relationship. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the relationship that exists between the colonizers and the colonized. Nothing that uh, comes from this declaration changes that relationship. It just uh, may give people a better feeling about living in, in, in that relationship, but it doesn't inform us that this relationship itself has to be destroyed. So I hope that was helpful, uh, Kamala Afua. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman, thank you. And if this Afua, she is located in the United Kingdom. So, Uhuru. That's um, increasingly not United, but that's another story. And increasingly, <laughs> not, increasingly not a kingdom. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, all right. Our next question comes from um, Maxwell on YouTube. Maxwell asks, any thoughts on Gaddafi's non-Marxist Islamic socialism? I've already said, it. I mean, uh, some people have done some good work and some people have done it, you know, um, you know, under religious auspices and things like that. Uh, 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 and, you know, uh, so, but that doesn't still change the reality of what a philosophical idealism is. It doesn't matter whose philosophical idealism it is. Uh, the fact is that uh, limit, severe limitations are placed on our movement, our struggle um, uh, by uh, philosophical idealism. And that uh, we have to uh, break through uh, philosophical idealism and come up with a scientific assessment and unite with the scientific assessment uh, of the world, our place in the world, if we're going to have genuine freedom. And the people need to be liberated uh, from superstition. Uh, we have too much to do. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, you know, roads and infrastructure to create. And, uh, you know, just as we did a few thousand years ago, I mean, we're living in a situation today where people don't have clean uh, uh, drinking water and access to different housing where a, a, a few thousand years ago, I mean, we had indoor toilets in, in Egypt and place like that. That didn't come from superstition. That came as a consequence of embracing a science. And uh, uh, that's what we're gonna have to do. We have to move beyond any form of superstition. And uh, so uh, this is, this is by no means uh, uh, is what I'm saying now, should what I'm saying now um, uh, negate uh, the, the uh, vicious uh, anti-African uh, attack uh, that the United States made on, 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 on Muammar Gaddafi, uh, the murder, the lynching in the streets and what have you, the contrived uh, basis for a NATO assault uh, led by the United States. <laughs> Well, certainly by France and the United States uh, uh, on Libya. And nothing that I've said should even suggest that, uh, 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 that uh, the fact that uh, Muammar Gaddafi, you know, had not fully embraced the materialist world view uh, uh, that somehow uh, it justifies uh, what the imperialists have done. And uh, so I, I wanna say that uh, even while recognizing uh, Gaddafi's uh, significance uh, to our movement, uh, that philosophical idealism, it doesn't resolve anything for us. It will not take us to the conclusions that we're looking for. And that's free human beings. And human beings being free, obviously, uh, from the uh, material, material uh, conditions imposed on us by our social system, but also <laughs> freeing our brains uh, so that we can even uh, uh, anticipate and realize and understand the ability of human beings ourselves uh, to solve our problems, that the contradiction we have faced with are human created contradictions. No gods did it to us. Uh, and that uh, our solution will not be brought by God, but by conscious uh, activity by human beings who have liberated our brains uh, to uh, the point that we are capable of taking responsibility uh, for the future that we're gonna have by creating that future ourselves without an assumption that some external force is gonna make that happen 
for us. No spooks, uh, no boogeymans, uh, nothing to that effect. Uhuru. <coughs> Uhuru Chairman, thank you. And that was again from Maxwell on YouTube. So um, getting down to our final questions here, uh, we're going back to one of Timba's in St. Louis, Missouri, in St. Louis, Missouri. He asked, what is the relationship between mode of production and social system? Uh, the mode of production is the social system that we are talking about. Uh, it is the social system. It is, it defines uh, the relationship and the forces of production, utilization of forces of production in a system. Uh, so it is the same uh, as the social system. A social system is comprised of a mode of production within which um, the, uh, a process of uh, production occurs, relations of production uh, uh, exist, uh, and the whole social system uh, is based on that. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about a mode of production, we're talking about a particular kind of social system, uh, like uh, uh, you know the feudal social system, and uh, like what people uh, like to characterize as capitalist social system. And we're saying it is a uh, the, it's a colonial uh, capitalist uh, social system. It's a social system that rests upon a, a colonial capitalist mode of production. Uhuru Temba. Uhuru, thank you, Temba and uh, Chairman. So um, looks like our last question uh, for today is coming from Comrade Jamal in Moorhead, Minnesota. And he asked, Uhuru, Comrade Chairman, thank you for the study. I took your recommendation to study on contradiction and have had to review it several times to really get it. Are there visual tools or other texts you might recommend that might assist in understanding each step and aspect involved in a dialectical analysis, uh, making a diagram or flowchart, for instance? Thank you, Comrade Jamal. Uh, yeah, I, I think that we have to do that, Jamal. And I think that um, that uh, people like yourself uh, who, uh, you know, like in the party and uh, becoming African internationalists, uh, you know, and who are competent uh, in that arena and need to be involved in making that happen. Because that's part of the way that, uh, that uh, this becomes yours uh, as well. And the ability to explain it uh, you know, and even be able to explain it uh, in, in language that's understood uh, by the people that we are communicating with. Um, so I think that, uh, that this is something we can do. What I've tried to do uh, throughout this process is to, to take what is posed to us, uh, I think in a relatively complicated, unnecessarily complicated way and I've tried to uh, speak to it uh, uh, in a language that is familiar uh, to, uh, to Africans and, and others uh, who uh, are not elitist and certainly not, uh, don't, are not privy to uh, the uh, institutions of the, of the colonial capitalist uh, bourgeoisie, the intellectuals and things like that. And I've tried to contribute to that. And I'm hopeful uh, that you and there are other people who uh, in our party and our work that can, uh, can, that can uh, contribute to this as well. Uh, so I think that's what's going to be really important. And uh, I think that's part of what helps to take, you know, what theory and place it in its proper relationship to the people. Because it's now something that we uh, get to uh, understand and we uh, introduce to as, um, as uh, the property uh, of the really um, uh, educated uh, sectors of the population, the, those who are most closely aligned to our oppressors, aligned with our oppressors and oppression, those who have the greatest proximity to the institutions that were created by the oppressor for their own benefit. <laughs> uh, uh, and, 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 you know, what they've done is they've taken, uh, they've colonized actual knowledge. Uh, they've taken uh, uh, the knowledge that's come from uh, uh, peoples uh, uh, over long periods of time, certainly that's true of Africa and other peoples. And they've, uh, they've, they've colonized it. They've, you know, you, you look at 
what is uh, considered this great leap in philosophical development and other development in Europe. And you can't possibly separate this great leap in their development uh, from this, the whole colonial slavery attack on the rest of the world. They refer to this, uh, you know, trade, growth, et cetera, et cetera, but they were invasions, they were theft. They were stealing genius, even the so-called uh, uh, slave trade, that uh, uh, transatlantic slave trade uh, was uh, partially in, uh, a part of stealing technologies, uh, stealing whole groups of people with certain uh, technological capacities on the continent of Africa and then transferring them to the United States. And I was uh, involved in a uh, discussion not too long ago revolving around uh, this whole uh, issue of inoculation and uh, how, you know, uh, it's very difficult to get uh, uh, African people anywhere in the world uh, to uh, unite uh, with, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, the, the whole notion of uh, the, the inoculation, the vaccinations and things like that. And, and I've, I've just recently looking at something and it shows how uh, in the United States, a small, uh, smallpox uh, epi uh, epidemic, uh, I guess it was called, uh, it was an African in 1700s uh, who was enslaved in Boston, Massachusetts, who uh, said, you know, if you want to deal with this, here's how we deal with it in Africa. Have see this, showed him a scratch on his arm and said that uh, when we had somebody who was infected by this, we simply took some of the post postulates and, and scratched our arm and put it on there. And that's the thing that warded off the disease. And the the white man, the colonizer in, in 1700s in Boston uh, wanted to treat it like some kind of African superstition and what have you. And uh, uh, only later uh, did they begin to uh, adapt this, adopt this and then use it in the United States as a form of inoculation against smallpox that the white man took credit for. And, uh, but the point is that African science and what have you was also part of what was stolen uh, in this process, this struggle, this war against Africa and African people. So, uh, you know, much of what we've come to understand about the world is due to the fact that uh, the colonizer uh, 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 has uh, actually colonized science and knowledge and things like that, claimed it uh, for his own, and then often use it against us, which is why Africans who, who were responsible for inoculation in the first place are uh, opposed to vaccination so much in the world now because uh, everything that has come, it has been uh, commodified. It is uh, uh, something that is now used against us despite the fact that we created much of this. And I've, I know I've spoken a long time, uh, Comrade uh, Director. Uh, I hope, uh, Comrade Jamal, that I did respond uh, uh, to what it is that you were raising. I see that you said something about uh, what is it? Uh, you made some statement about you've heard colonizers uh, uh, say, I've heard colonizers call it cultural exchange. Yeah, cultural exchange as well. <laughs> yeah, that's what a kidnapping is. You're just exchanging culture. <laughs> yeah, and that's what happens when you are the, the oppressor or the colonizer. You dominate the world, you define the world, you know? You define the, you would define rape of a 13 year old girl like Sally Hinn and you, you define it as a relationship, like a slave can have a relationship with a rapist, uh, terrorist, hunky slave master like Thomas Jefferson, who uh, uh, in, in the US and much of the world is being traumatized by the fact that the, uh, the colonizer are breaking free from that and, and actually identifying the colonizer for who the hell he really is and that relationship for what it really is. African internationalism, will help uh, to give some clarity and definition to that understanding and say where the hell it is that we have to go and make a, and it makes a prediction of our victory uh, for our liberation. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman, thank you so much. And thank you, Jamal, for your question. And that's gonna wrap up the Q&A portion, Chairman, uh, for today. And I just wanna thank everybody for submitting those questions and just engaging and helping us to deepen this discussion. So Chairman, it's about that time. I wanna just turn it over to you for any closing remarks before we uh, close this out. Uh -huh. Thank you, Comrade Director Keeley. I just want to say uh, that uh, everyone in the party should be uh, organizing, uh, preparing for the uh, plenary, for our third plenary for our seventh Congress that's gonna be happening in February. And uh, it's going to be an extraordinary plenary and it's going to set new markers uh, for how our work is going to be carried out. 
Uh, and it is going to do this while recognizing the significance of, 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 of the party the, or 50 year history of the African People's Socialist Party that more than any other force in the world um, was able uh, to maintain the continuum of revolutionary struggle since the Garvey movement that the African People's Socialist Party has been that organization uh, the only organization that has maintained this, uh, this continuum uh, struggling for the total liberation of Africa, every ounce of Africa and African people, uh, understanding that Africa for Africans at home and abroad, the African People's Socialist Party has taken uh, African fundamentalist Garveyism uh, into the 21st century uh, uh, with African internationalism. And uh, the plenary will uh, talk about this and will move us forward into this next uh, phase of revolutionary struggle and transformation that we are involved in. So I'm hoping that everybody, all members of the party and of the Huru movement uh, are working assiduously to uh, prepare uh, for that plenary, to get to that plenary from wherever you're located around the world. When I say get to it, I mean via social media or whatever other kinds of platforms uh, that's available to us to do that. But uh, Let's do it. And uh, I'm extraordinarily excited about this era, this period of crisis of the social system. And uh, somebody, Dimitri uh, Hester, has just said to us, uh, 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 cut heads and burn houses and otherwise let's carry out the mission that was uh, left to us uh, 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 by uh, Comrade John Jock Dessaline in Haiti. Let's win. Uhuru. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, thank you. And for uh, people who want to register for the plenary, visit APSPplenary.org. Register today, $25 um, for all four days. So again, I just really want to appreciate you, Chairman, your leadership through this whole study of dialectical materialism and really African internationalism. Again, I want to thank all of you guys for tuning in with us. We will be back next Sunday, 8 a.m. Eastern. So again, thank you. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Tommy Sunday study and continue to support the OTM show by donating to paypal.me slash Omali Tommy. Uhuru.